So thanks to everyone who's joined for this. And I've got some slides. I'm going to get through them in about 15 minutes. I'm going to start off talking a little bit about what the market's done recently and try and put that into context relative to historical market movements. And then I'm going to move on to talking a little bit about the economy and try and figure out what the parts are that, the, that are most at risk in, uh, in this current crisis and, and potentially how we could see the recovery from that. So starting off, I have a chart here, um, the dark blue line in this chart is the MSCI World Index. So around the 20th of February, when the investors globally started realizing that this COVID uh, crisis was not just a Chinese problem, uh, markets fell about 35% over the course of about four weeks. They bounced back pretty hard from there. So over the three weeks that followed that, we've seen them bounce back about 24%. And these slides were all prepared over the weekend. So these are a couple of days old. They've actually bounced a little harder in the last couple of days. So we've seen a pretty good recovery. The brown line in that chart is our local market in US dollar terms. So over those same first four weeks, we saw the, the local market fall about 45% in US dollar terms. It's also bounced back over the last three odd weeks by about 30%. So for context, the MSCI world, the level it's at now is uh, roughly where it was back in the middle of 2017. So we've lost about three years of growth in global equity markets. And looking at the local market, it's taken us back to about the beginning of 2013. So about six years of growth have been wiped out uh, in this latest bear market. So as Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it usually rhymes. So we're going to try and look at some of the historical movements in markets and put this one into context. Um, and so I'll start off by looking at U.S. markets. I've taken data for the last 40 years for U.S. markets, and that includes about five bull and five bear markets. So the first stat I want to take you through is the, is the, quant, is the duration of these bull and bear markets. So the, the dark blue bar on the left-hand side is bull markets over the last 40 years in the U.S. And they've ranged anywhere from about two and a half years for the shortest one to 11 years for the longest one. And that's the one that we've just come through that ended in, in, uh, in mid-February. But on average, markets tend to go up for about six and a half years. Uh, then bear markets in that right-hand bar they tend to go down for much, much less time. So on average, market, bear markets last just over a year. Uh, and for context, the current one, if we think that that 34% um, trough that happened after about four weeks is as bad as it gets, that would be comfortably the shortest bear market we've seen in the US, certainly in the last 40 odd years. In terms of how much markets move over the course of those bull and bear markets, again, on the left-hand side, that's uh, the chart of the um, quantum of, of bull markets. And so you can expect to quadruple your money on average during, the, during bull markets in the US. And uh, on the right-hand side there, during bear markets, you lose about a third of the value of those assets. And then just zooming in uh, specifically on the bear markets, so on average, as I say, you lose about a third of your money. If this uh, trough was, was as bad as it get, got after four weeks, that would have been roughly in line with historical averages. But obviously, if things have snapped back pretty quickly and, and markets are now really down only about 12 or 13 percent since, um, since the peak in, in mid-February. Switching to the South African market, and again, looking at similar stats, we only have about 25 years of data for the local all share index. Um, but looking at, at similar things, we've had eight bull and bear markets in the last 25 years in South Africa. That took us about 55 years in the US to achieve the same number of bull and bear markets. So obviously the frequency of these cycles is a lot quicker in South Africa. On average, bull markets last two and a half years and bear markets last just a fraction of that at about six months. The current bear market is by far the longest we've experienced in the last 25 years. Markets peaked in January of 2018. So it's been over two years in this, in this current bear market. Uh, in terms of the quantum of returns you can expect during those bull and bear markets, similar to, to offshore markets, you can more than double your money in, in bull markets and you lose about a third in bear markets. And then focusing on, on this latest one, uh, even though this one has lasted over two years, the, the cumulative return over that time is only down about 25%. So on the low end of the, of the range of expected outcomes that we see in typical bear markets in South Africa. 
So 16th century uh, Spanish writer uh, Miguel Saavedra, who wrote Don Quixote, said, forewarned, forearmed, to be prepared is half the victory. And so um, I just want to look a little bit at what it feels like day to day to be in bull and bear markets. So for a start, it, markets are not always going up when, when we're in a bull market and not, markets are not always going down when we're in the bear market. And this chart over here um, looks at data on the left-hand side of this chart for the US. So the blue bars are, are bull markets. And this is the percentage of positive days you get. So in a bull market, in bull markets in the US, roughly only slightly more than half of the days are positive. And in bear markets in that red bar, roughly only slightly less than half of days are, are positive, in, even in bear markets. Um, and it's a pretty similar story for South Africa. About 56% of days are, uh, markets are going up in bull markets and about 43% of days markets are going up even in bear markets. Um, but it's the this extreme level of those moves that we tend to experience more in bear markets. And so this chart on the right hand side, again, blue bars in, uh, represent bull markets, red bars represent bear markets. And starting on the very left, those two bars there show moves in the US market greater than two and a half percent in a single day. Uh, and, and you're very unlikely to experience those days in bull markets. Less than one percent of days in bull markets are up over one, uh, up over two and a half percent. In bear markets, about 5% of days are up over 2.5%. And this creates a lot of FOMO. So you see big bounces in the market. People worried that they've missed the bottom. Um, but just to, to point out here that these things are really common in, in certainly in um, global bear markets to see big up days. Uh, not so much the case in SA, those next two bars on the right there. Um, South African markets don't tend to experience as a uh, higher frequency of big up days in uh, bear markets relative to bull markets. And then on the right hand side of that chart, the big down days, so moves of uh, more than two and a half percent down uh, in both US and, and SA markets as expected are, are much more prevalent during bear markets. So we've talked about a little bit about the, what the markets are doing. Now we want to look at the economy because ultimately this is the playing field that all of these companies have to operate in in the foreseeable future. So we want to focus in on and kind of where the pain might come from and how quickly it might recover. So just to start off with, this is uh, banks around the world and how well capitalized they are, how strong their balance sheets are going into this. And the dark blue bars are, are now um, the average of banks around the world uh, and their capital positions now and the light blue bars are what they were going into the GFC. And in the GFC, banks were at the, at the heart of the problem. Um, they weren't well capitalized and they caused systems to, to seize up. What we see this time around is that banks are in significantly better shape um, and pretty well capitalized. And even in the middle of that chart, you see South Africa's uh, bank's capital position has decreased. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that. That's mostly accounting and, and, and regulatory issues. But the point is that even South African banks are extremely well capitalized going into this crisis. So that's a good sign. And then just trying to focus in on the economic activity and what areas that we might expect to see uh, some of the pain coming in and how significant that could be. So I start off with uh, US GDP contributions. I tend to focus on US um, economic numbers. Uh, when I look at global activity, it is the largest economy, but it's obviously not the only important economy out there. But what they do have is, is much more granular and detailed data that allows us to do good analysis. And it tends to be a pretty good proxy for how, for how developed markets in general work. So it's a, it's a good insight into that. And as you can see from this chart, by far the biggest chunk of economic activity comes from household consumption or, or personal spending, about two thirds of economic activity. And then the rest is split roughly evenly between what governments spend and what we spend on private investment. If I look at the SA economy, it's, it's pretty similar story. So the, by far the biggest chunk around 60% is household spending and consumption. And then the rest again is split pretty evenly between uh, government spending and private investment, those are about 20% each. Uh, 
So what typically happens in recessions, and on this chart I have the last three U.S. recessions. So on the left-hand side there, the uh, global financial crisis in 2008. In the middle, we have the tech bubble from 2001. And on the right-hand side was the, the oil shock in the early 90s. So those are the last three U.S. recessions we've seen. And those little bars in each of those charts try to represent um, the contribution of each of the components of, active, of economic activity to the declines. Um, and, and what I want you to mainly take away from this is the highlighted red bar in each of those charts, which is significantly the, the, the biggest impact in all three of those uh, recessions, those last three recessions, has been private investment. So despite the fact that this only makes up about 20% of economic activity, the sharp drop in activity in this space tends to be the biggest source of pain in most recessions. Um, and obviously you have uh, a drawdown in, in discretionary spending, which adds to the pain, but not nearly significantly as we see from private investment. So knowing what we know about the past economic recessions, I just want to drill down in a little bit more detail into, the, um, into each of those areas of economic activity and talk about the areas that might be most at risk. So here I have the three sections, household consumption, private investment, and government expenditure. I've used a traffic lighting system to try and highlight in red the areas that are most likely to see significant drops in, in activity. Orange are the ones that might see some drop in activity. And then green are the areas where we think they're pretty safe or might even see an increase in spending. Uh, so as we know, private investment is an area that we're particularly worried about. <clears throat> and you can see those categories there, uh, commercial building, uh, residential building, purchase of equipment, including IT equipment, uh, R&D spending on intellectual property. Those are areas that we're likely to see significant drops when people are concerned about committing uh, big amounts of expenditure to long-term capital projects. Um, at the bottom there, you see the government expenditure. I'll talk in a few minutes about the fiscal response that we've seen, but we think that area is pretty safe and, and frankly likely to grow uh, to a large extent. And then the biggest area, household consumption, I'll blow that out into a little bit more detail in the three categories, so discretionary, non-discretionary, and partially discretionary. And again, I've used that traffic lighting system. So the stuff in orange there, buying cars and furniture and clothing, that stuff's likely to see a little bit of a decline. Um, the stuff in green there, so buying groceries, uh, paying electricity bills, rent and uh, utilities and mortgages, paying for healthcare, that stuff's all probably fine. Um, the areas that we're most concerned about are recreation services. So that's things like going to movies, going to theme parks, sporting events, um, and then food services and accommodations, bars, restaurants, hotels, those are, are areas that are particularly susceptible in this environment. And they make up about 10% of uh, household consumption, which means they're about 7% of overall economic activity. And those areas can get pretty close to zero in this environment. So that's, that's the area we're pretty concerned about now. And then following on from that, uh, what does that mean for jobs? And again, this is a chart that each of the bars here represent areas of the US employment that we think are most at risk in this crisis. And so that uh, blue bar on the far left-hand side there, um, in people employed in retail in the US, if we exclude those that are employed in online and we exclude those working at grocery stores or pharmacies, that's about 7% of the total workforce in the US. Um, if we look at air transportation, real estate, and oil services combined, there's another 3% of the, the U.S. workforce. And then finally, that bar um, that says leisure and hospitality, that's a whopping 11% of total employment in the U.S. Is, is related to leisure and hospitality. And these, as we pointed out on the previous slide, are areas that are pretty much at risk in this COVID lockdown. So there's about 170 million people employed in the U.S. And over the course of the last three weeks, we've seen about 17 million of those apply for unemployment benefits for the first time. So over 10 percent of the U.S. workforce uh, has become uh, unemployed in the, in the course of the last few weeks. And so we're ready to see uh, big bites happening in this. And, we're, and we need government to focus on getting these areas of activity started as quickly as possible if we're to prevent a, a major employment crisis.
So the good news is that governments have stepped up, and Dr. Enthoven touched on this briefly in his um, in his speech, but these blue bars on this chart represent the billions of dollars pledged by those six uh, economies, the six biggest economies in the world. Uh, so starting on the left, you have about $2 trillion pledged by the U.S. government towards stepping into the gap created by this uh, hiatus in economic activity. The, the little red squares on that represent the proportion of uh, economic output that that uh, commitment uh, represents. So for the U.S., for example, it's committed $2 trillion, which represents about 10% of their annual economic activity. For Japan, it's 20%, a $1 trillion. Um, and if we combine all that spending together, we get to about $4 trillion, which represents about 4.5% of total global economic output. Um, and so we're excited to see governments stepping into the gap left by um, some of the other areas of economic activity at the moment. So that's all very well, government stepping into the hole for now, but we want to figure out how quickly we can get back on our feet again. Um, and so we're going to look at China's experience. They're about uh, roughly about two months ahead of the rest of the world in terms of the path to recovery. So about two months ago, the, the number of infections in China started falling off pretty dramatically and they were able to slowly start opening their economy again. And we want to look at some of the early indicators to figure out um, how that economic recovery and might happen as the economies reopen. So starting on this first slide, uh, on the left-hand side, there's, there's three charts that represent the um, public transport activity in China since the crisis or since the beginning of the year. And so you can see, for example, that blue chart on the left-hand side, road public transport, which represents people traveling on buses that dropped from over, seven, over 60 million people per day traveling on buses in China pre the COVID crisis. That's now less than 20 million people a day. Uh, and similar story for rail and air transport. Uh, those, have, those have dropped by about 70% um, since, since before the crisis. The good news on the right-hand side of that slide, and that's passenger traffic on, on um, Chinese roads, uh, the blue bars being passenger traffic that we've seen in the last sort of six weeks, uh, compared to the brown bars, which represent the same six weeks last year. And so that's pretty encouraging to see that although people are shunning public transport, they're not, they're not stuck in their homes. There's still about as many people out and about on the roads as there were this time last year in China. Just this next slide zooms in on that one particular component of the previous slide where we looked at air transportation. So as I said, that's dropped off by about 70%. This is a chart just representing the, the major airports uh, in China. Um, and, the, and the one thing I want you to take away from this slide is the fact that the trajectory is not great. So we're not seeing any signs of improvement in air travel, even two months out from uh, the release of some of the movement restrictions. And that doesn't bode particularly well for travel and leisure spending in terms of the pace of the recovery of that sector. Similarly for property sales. So this is a chart showing um, first year cities in China um, and the number of property or, or the property transactions by square meters. Um, and even those, though they've recovered slightly in the last six weeks or two months, they're still at less than half the level that we saw uh, pre the COVID crisis. So it's so struggling to recover as quickly there. The good news is on the industrial side of the economy, we're seeing a pretty sharp snapback. So this chart represents uh, in that solid dark blue line, the coal consumption by China's main uh, power plants. And we compare that in that dotted blue line to the coal consumption that we saw over the same period year to date in, in 2019. And the good news is that that's pretty close to, to sort of normal levels there. So heavy industrial activity seems to be back to normal and snap back pretty quickly in China. And then the last slide that I want to talk about is the, is the shipping activity in and out of China. So I'm not going to go into detail on those six charts there, but what I want you to take away is the fact that various forms of shipping activity into and out of China uh, has snapped back pretty fast over the course of the last few weeks since the movement restrictions have lifted. And so it looks like import and export activity is also one of the areas that snapped back pretty quickly. <clears throat> 
And so just to wrap it up from my, my perspective, so we've seen the markets move really sharply in a really short space of time and then bounce back really sharply. Um, if that's as bad as it gets, it will be comfortably one of the shortest uh, bear markets we've seen. Uh, our best bet is that we're likely in for a little bit more volatility going forward. Uh, in terms of the economic activity, we've seen a really quick and a really uh, a deep drop off in economic activity. Governments have stepped in for now and uh, helped plug some of those holes. Um, and if in terms of the economy getting back onto its own two feet, we see that as slightly uneven. Hopefully the industrial activity comes back pretty quickly but uh, things around travel and leisure are obviously likely to linger a little bit longer and that has uh, all sorts of consequences for employment. 